Our memory verse for this week comes from Psalm 121, 1 and 2. You'll also find it at the bottom of your worship guide on the message side. These are the words that are there. Read these with me, if you would, please. Let's read together. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Aren't you glad that our help is not just in the mountains, but in the God who made the mountains? And he made the heavens above it. Read it again with me. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Well, good morning. Let's take our Bibles and uh, turn together to Mark chapter 1, but there with verse 35. We're going to look at two passages this morning, Mark 1 and then Matthew 6, but I want to share part two this morning of a message uh, that I began last week entitled, Building Your Life on Prayer. Let's say that together, together. Let's do it in unison. Are you ready? Building Your Life on Prayer. Now, remember from last week, that we learn that prayer is intimate communication with God. It's a great definition. It's intimate communication with God. So that means if it's intimate communication, there's a listening principle to prayer, right? And there's a talking principle. Now, how many times when in church or whether you're at home, you say, let us pray, what do we always immediately begin to do? Talk. Right? We always begin to talk. And so... If our children are learning to pray based on listening to us pray, they would rarely ever listen in prayer. So I, I want to challenge you this morning to understand prayer in a much more comprehensive way. It's not just us talking to God, but it's also us hearing from Him. It's intimate communication with God. I want you to think about prayer like this. It is a relationship. It is not religion. Very different. It's the means by which God has ordained for us as His redeemed children to nurture our relationship with Him. How many of you recognize this morning that God wants you to have a healthy relationship with Him? And how does that relationship start? It starts with a commitment to Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ alone that enables us to have a relationship with the Father. And so God wants us to to use prayer primarily to nurture our relationship. He wants us to have a healthy relationship with Him. But also, prayer is also the means by which we receive grace, okay, to receive the things that we need in life and in ministry. I like to say it like this. Prayer is the lifeblood of the Christian life. It it is the lifeblood of the Christian faith. It's our heartbeat. It's the source of a healthy relationship with God. This is why Paul commands us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Remember, this was the verse we looked at last week. He says, be joyful always. Okay, so that means smile. I mean, seriously, smile, right? Be joyful always. The worst thing can happen is you go to heaven if you're Christian. In other words, live with an eternal perspective. Even if everything else you lose, you don't lose your salvation. So there's a reason to be joyful. And then notice what he says in the middle. Pray continually. Isn't that an interesting uh, directive or command, right? Um, You see, it is God's will in Jesus Christ that we walk in uh, constant fellowship with him. Hey, Paul reminds us, pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances. And notice this last part, for this is the will of God for each of us. So it's God's will that we walk in a continual relationship and prayer is the anchor for that relationship. Prayer is the access point of heaven's power. It's the key to a healthy relationship with God. And so let me just say it like this. God really wants us to have an everyday, every moment uh, type of relationship, right? He, he, he wants, in fact, that was the main idea. If you remember from last week, the main idea was that God wants us to be a pray first and pray always type of people, right? When he says pray continually, that, that's what it means. He, he wants much more than a relationship with you on Sunday morning, right? Much more than that, right? It's, it's a pray first and pray always. So the question is, if this is what God wants, 
How can we do this? Well, last week we learned that for, to start with, we've got to rightly view and relate to all three persons of the Trinity. This was the main part of the message last week. And, and let me just stop and say this. Did you know the way you view God has the power to change everything about your Christian life? So if we don't view God rightly, right, like we won't enjoy prayer. If we think God is mad with us and, and God is a red-faced, smoke-blowing monster that wants to just beat us over the head, why would we want to pray to Him? I want to remind you that if you are a believer... In Jesus Christ, you've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ and your sin has been paid for. God's wrath or judgment on your behalf has been fully absorbed in Jesus. Can I tell you, because of the blood of Jesus, God is not mad with you. And therefore, we can approach Him as redeemed children, right? As His children. And so it's so important for us to understand that. So the way we view God will, will determine what kind of relationship we have, we have with Him. And where does our relationship with God start? It starts with Jesus. So last week, we, we learned that we need to come to Jesus as our gracious mediator. We, we recognize that, that Jesus is the one, through His life, death, and resurrection, we now have access to the Father. So think about Jesus as the reservoir. All of who God is, okay, is made available to us. And Jesus is the one who connects us to the Father, right? He's our Savior, the one who made a way for you and I to experience the love and blessings of the Father. And so we might pray something like this. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, right? Because outside of his righteousness, we can't approach God, right? So Jesus, we just want to thank you for being our Savior. Like, when's the last time in prayer you thank, you thank Jesus for dying for you, right? Do you understand it was in his atoning death on the cross that enables you to even pray and talk to God? So, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I mean, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And all of that is because of Christ. And so we come to Jesus as our mediator, our gracious mediator. He's the one that's connected us to the Father. So our relationship with God started with Jesus. And then we come to the Father as a loving parent, right? So the Father is like an overflowing fountain of pure love and pure blessings. And so in Jesus, all the love and all the blessings of the Father have been are poured out on us. It's beautiful. And then we come to the Holy Spirit as a faithful friend and a helper. And by, by the way, who's the, only, who's the only person of the Trinity that's indwelt us as human beings? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one, like, when we're dealing with temptation, we say, Holy Spirit, show us the way out. Or if we're dealing with a difficult time, Holy Spirit, help us overcome this battle in our life. You see, He is the one who enables us to live the Christian life and to fulfill God's plan. He's like a stream of living water that flows from the Father and from the Son. So from last week, we, we learned it's important for, have, for us to, to relate to God as Scripture de declares Him. He is one. But he is what? Three persons. And each person is distinct and he's relational. And so, look, here's the most important thing about prayer. It's not about the words you pray. It's about the persons you pray to. Right? I mean, just uh, last week, my, my mom celebrated her 80th birthday. We all had a big birthday party. And I don't even remember everything that I said. But I know who I was talking to. And it was... It was her. She made that day special. My words don't make it special, but, but, but it's the person I'm speaking to that made it special, right? And so I want you to think about, it's not about the words, but it's about the persons to whom our prayers are directed. Our prayers are directed to the Father and to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit. Very, very important. So once we have the right view of God, now here's the second step that we build on. Here's the second one, today, we have to make prayer a top priority by scheduling daily times with God. This is very important. Notice I say times could be plural there. Look with me at Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Many of you are familiar with this, but let me just uh, give you a little bit of the background. Remember, at age 30, uh, Jesus had been working in his earthly father's carpenter shop. He, he, he took off the carpenter's apron, hung it up. Brushed off the wood shavings. And what did he do? He began his ministry. And where did that start? With baptism. Remember? 
Remember at baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, right? Remember, he was fully man, right? The Spirit of God empowered him, led him where? He led him on a cruise. No, on a vacation. No, out into the desert where he was tempted. Wow, it's a great place to start in ministry, isn't it? Huh? Right? And, and, and then after that time where he'd overcome temptation with prayer and fasting, relying on the Spirit and relying on his relationship with the Father, he comes out, he chooses his first disciples, he begins ministry there in Capernaum, which is in Galilee, and he casts out evil spirits, he heals all kinds of diseased people, he does all types of ministry. And then look at verse 35, with that setting... Remember, he's had a long, long weekend of ministry. He's looking for a day off. What does he do? He sleeps in to 11 o'clock and he orders something by on DoorDash. Nope, that's not what he does. Look at verse 35. Very early in the morning. And a lot of people said, ugh. Very early in the morning while it was still dark. And other people said, ugh. Jesus got up left the house and went off to a what? To a solitary place where he checked his Facebook, made sure no one had called through the night, checked his messages. Now, what did he do? He prayed. You see, the Gospels reveal that Jesus made prayer a priority in his life. And it's not just a priority, but a first priority, right? It was his normal rhythm and daily pattern. And all through the Gospels, we see Jesus demonstrating this, okay? So listen, we're following the model of all models when we set apart uh, specific times in our day to spend with God. Now, in the book of Acts, in the early church, we see the same thing. They demonstrated this all through the book of Acts. They all joined together, Acts 1.14 says. They all joined together constantly where? Constantly in. Okay, so you, you, you've got individual prayer and you've got corporate prayer, right? How, how many of you know there are three types of prayer? There's closet prayer where it's, it's, it's private there's group prayer where maybe there's a few of you. And then there's corporate prayer when all of us pray, right? So these are three types of prayer. And listen, both in the life of Jesus and in the life of the early church, we see them making prayer a top priority. They all would join together constantly in prayer. Now, I'm reminded of the words of John Bunyan when he, he said this. He says, he who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. Let's read this together. Let's read it loud. He who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. In other words, when we put God first in our day, God blesses the rest of our day. It sets a precedent, if you will, for the rest of our day. Henry Drummond said this. He said, 10 minutes spent in the presence of Christ every day or two minutes will make the whole day different. How many of you have that as a testimony? Like you, you've had experience when like that, that's real, right? That is real. You see, the first has the power to bless the rest. So when you make the decision to start each day in prayer... Okay, uh, this is going to enable you to connect with God first thing. All right. And it's going to set the precedent for the rest of your day. And can I just say this? Prayer is just one of the ways that we demonstrate that God is first. One of the ways that we express and prove that God is first in our life. And it's how we can keep him first throughout the day. Let me kind of illustrate it this way. The same is true with the tithe. When you and I pay the tithe, remember, God, God commands us as believers to put him first in all of life. That includes our resources, not just our day and our time. When we, when we give Jesus the first tenth of our resources, we're putting him first. And by the way, a lot of times people think about or focus only on what the tithe means, a tenth. Look, the most important thing about it is the first part. It's the order. 
Yeah, yes, it's the amount, and the amount does matter, but it's the order that matters. It's like you're saying, God, I am trusting you in this area of my life, and I'm going to put you first. It's not leftover giving. It's putting him first in our lives. And so when, when, we, when we do this, what are we doing? We're demonstrating that God is first in our lives. We're trusting him to take care of the rest. So here, here's another one. Let me give you this illustration. When you give God the first day of your week, that's today, like, why are you here this morning? I'm asking you the question, why are you here? Because it's Sunday and it's the thing to do? Well, this is not the Sabbath. You see, after the resurrection, the early church began to meet on the first day of the week. And no doubt the resurrection of Christ on Sunday has a lot to do that. But can I tell you, I want to suggest something else. It's the first day of the week. So when you get up and say, you know what, I'm going to worship today. What are you saying? I'm giving God the first day of my week. And that's going to enable him to bless the rest of the days of your week. It's going to set the precedent for the rest of your week. So it's the first part of my day. It's the first part of my income. And it's the first part of my week. And I'm going to put God where? I'm going to put God first. Now, I want to tell you something about God. God demands to be first. And he will not play second. He demands. In fact, in the first commandment in Exodus chapter 20, what does he say? You shall have no other what? No other gods before me. And I want to make sure you hear me. This command applies to us as well. God wants to be the center of our attention, first in our attention. Not suck it to your boyfriend. Or your wife or your grandbaby. God wants to be first in your attention. He wants you to be first in our affection, our attitudes, and all of our actions. So let me just kind of summarize it like this. When we give God first of anything, our income, our time, our attention, our energy, what are we doing? We're declaring that he's first in our life. Don't, don't say he's first and not give him first place so we honor God by our first practices what are your first practices checking your email skimming over social media what are you communicating about what you most value with your first practices this is where Jesus is dialing down here with us I love Smith Wigglesworth he said this I don't often spend more than a half an hour in prayer at one time, but I never go more than a half an hour without praying. This is the will of God for you too. That we pray what? Continually. That we nurture this relationship we have with God. I like Corey Ten Boom. She said, don't pray when you feel like it. How many of you know that sometimes you just don't feel like doing the right thing? Like some of you, like you're here this morning, but you didn't feel like coming. Right? I mean, in our first service, I, I prayed with an older lady at the end. I mean, she's such an inspiration to me because she pushes. I mean, I know she is not able to come. I know that, I mean, that many people would say, you don't need to come. But she's always pushing in her wheelchair. She's always, I and mean, she's even coming to the early service today. I'm like, man, you, you encouraged me, right? But she wanted to do that. Court Denver says, don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and what? And keep it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. So let me ask you. Do you have a scheduled time with the Lord? Do you have a scheduled times with the Lord in your day? You know, one of my favorite stories in all the Bible was Daniel in the lion's den. You remember the story? I want to ask you, do you remember the story? Oh, okay. You, you remember Daniel's exiled, foreigner, captive in a foreign land. And he finds favor with God and he's promoted to second in the kingdom. It'd be like someone coming here from Russia and in 40 days they named a vice president. Right? And all the other people that were in line for the second position, they're jealous of him. And they're like, we, we, we got to take him out. What, what, what are we going to do? Well, they inspected his life and there was nothing that they could get him on. And they said, oh, we know one thing we can get him on. 
If we can get the king to issue a decree that it's illegal to pray to any other God except for the king, then we know him because we've been watching his life. And guess what he's been doing every day? Three times a day, just like clockwork, he goes up to his room, opens up his window, and faces toward Jerusalem, and he prays to the God of heaven. And you know what happened? The king issued a decree. Daniel was found guilty. And because of that, he was thrown in the lion's den. Remember, the king's heart was broken. The king didn't want him to be devoured by the lions, but he couldn't overturn his decree. And so the next morning after spending the night, the king comes out and he's like, Oh, Daniel, oh, Daniel. And Daniel's like, I'm alive. An angel shut the mouth of the lion, right? I mean, but I just want you to understand the consistency, okay? These scheduled times in Daniel's life are a pattern for us to follow. Also in Jesus' life. So here's my question. I want you to consider writing this down. What would you have to rearrange to make prayer a first priority? What would you have to rearrange in your daily schedule? Okay? To make prayer a first priority. That's a question you want the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom on and to speak into your life. Here's the second piece, though. Now that we've got the right view of God, now that we've got our time, right? We, we, we've got our time, the time that's best for our personality, right? That's conducive for worship. Then we've got to choose a meeting place for our time with God. I like to say it like this. Everyone needs a special spot where they can consistently meet with God. Now, this place should be free of distraction. It should be conducive for worship and intimacy with God. Notice here in Mark 135, Jesus had a place. It says Jesus got up and he went out to what? An isolated or a solitary place. This is very important. A distraction-free environment. How many of you recognize that we are a very distracted people? And focus is very important because who is the focus of prayer? God is. And so we had to remove all of these, th this noise in our life. And can I just tell you, look, there's a lot of external noise that, that, that really distracts us. But can I tell you the greatest barrier is not external noise, it's internal noise. How many of you realize just how loud it is on the inside? I mean, you can shut off a lot of things on the outside very quickly, but how long does it really take you to quiet down so that you can hear the voice of God? And one of the reasons we don't hear, uh, uh, practice the listening principle in prayer is because we never hear God say anything. And the reason we don't hear, if we had slowed down and quieted down enough to hear Him, He's speaking. He's desiring to speak to us. In Matthew 14, it says after he sent out the crowds to home, that he went up on the hills by himself to pray. So Jesus often found his private spot out in nature, on, in the mountains, outside of the crowds. And so let me just say it like this. We need to find an undistracted environment. Turn off the TV. No computers. No phones. No tablets. How many of you recognize the name John Wesley? Famous 18th century evangelist. His mother was named Susanna. Are you ready? She had 19 children. Let me say it. She had 19 children. How do you have a quiet time? <laughs> and some of our moms have one children. They're thinking, oh my gosh. Right? 19. She found her place, her scheduled place in a chair in her home. And this is what she would do. She would take her apron and she would cover her head like a prayer shawl. And listen, all the kids know, don't mess with mama when the apron's over her head. Right? So, look, I'm just saying we need to do what we need to do. Right? 
And, and look, it made a huge impact on all of her kids because what was mama doing? Mama was... Dim- and look, when you are interrupted in your prayer closet, mama, let the kid come in. Let the child listen to you pray. How do you think they learn how to pray? They listen to us pray. Let, let them come in. Show them how you are talking to God. Let them be a part of that and then get them out. Because it's your closet it's your place, but, but it's just a beautiful story. So here's my question. What place would be most conducive for prayer? What place would work best for you? You're thinking right now, Holy Spirit, what is that place? And some of you are like, okay, I've got that place, but I'll tell you, it's become stale. Can I tell you? Find a new place. Right? And, and you can have one place in the morning, and then you can have maybe one at noon or in the afternoon or at night. They don't have to be the same place. It, it can be outside. It can be a prayer walk. Uh, that's my favorite thing to do in the afternoon is a prayer walk. It don't have to be an hour. It can be 20 minutes. But you can pray your neighborhood. You can pray. I walk this campus, and I pray over this campus. I'll just walk out and just say, okay, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes just praying. And you know what? A meaningful time with God will do three things for you. It'll give you spiritual power that otherwise you don't have. Anybody need some power this morning? Not only will it give you some spiritual power, but it'll give you spiritual direction. Anybody got to make some decisions on where to go to school and who to marry and where to work? How many of you need a spiritual GPS? We need direction. And oftentimes we lack direction because we don't spend time with God. We don't ask Him. We don't seek Him for His direction. So time with Him will become a source of spiritual direction. And then here's my last part. If you spend time with God, He'll load you up with some spiritual purpose. He'll fill your life with meaning. You know, oftentimes we we go through life as if, you know, my day, my life doesn't matter. But time with God will help you understand that your day does matter, right? And it gives us spiritual purpose. So listen, these are very elementary principles, but we, we, we need to be reminded and challenged. We've got to make prayer top priority. How do we do that? We've got to schedule times with God. We've got to put it on our calendar. We've got to invite accountability, right? We've got to do that. And then we've got to choose that right place for our time with God in prayer. And then finally, if you flip over with me to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, beginning there with verse 9, we've got to adopt and implement Jesus' prayer pattern. Now, I want you to listen very carefully for a few minutes. Jesus gives us the model of all models when it comes to prayer. And I want you to understand that what Jesus is given here in the Lord's Prayer is not optional. So I want to just ask you up front, How does your prayer life line up with the pattern of Jesus' prayer life? Because here's here's the pattern I hear a lot. Are you ready? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Help me, help me, help me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Listen to people pray. Listen closely. Thank you, thank you. Help me, 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 help me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. By so impersonable. It's not the pattern that Jesus gave us. And can I just say this? I believe that the Lord's Prayer is the most neglected or ignored directive from Jesus. Jesus is speaking specifically. He says, this is how believing disciples should pray. He doesn't say repeat it. He says, pray like this. This is a template. This is an outline. And this outline should shape your prayer life and my prayer life, our prayer life. Okay? So I'm going to walk through it real quickly and break down each distinctive element from it. Number one, from the first part of the prayer, we learn that we need to first connect with God relationally. You know, sometimes when you hear people pray, it sounds like they're talking to a rock or tree. God is knowable. Last week, we we talked about the three monotheistic faiths, right? Judaism and Islam and Christianity. Do you believe? Islam believes, yeah, they believe there's one God, but they don't believe he's knowable. Knowable. Judaism believes in one God, but they they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. And, And they're still waiting for the Messiah, the promised Messiah. 
But Christianity believes in one God and that Jesus is the exact representation of that God. And he is the one mediator between a sinful man and a holy God. And so listen, look how he starts the prayer. Our Father in heaven. You know what that speaks to? The need for you and me to focus on who we're talking to. This is to remind us that we come before God as His children, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And how do we come before the Father? We come with respect, but we also come with intimacy. Here's what Christ is making clear here. That we're not praying for a relationship, we're praying from a relationship. Okay? And that's so very important. I love Ephesians 2.18. Look what it says. This, by the way, really teaches you a whole lot about prayer. For through him, speaking of Jesus, we both, who is that? Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father by one spirit. Now, let, let me help you with this. We pray to the Father through the Son by the Spirit. You say, how does that work? It's the Holy Spirit that draws us to Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that convinces us in our sin and deadness, okay, that we need a Savior. It's the Holy Spirit that awakens us to our need for forgiveness and awakens us to the fact that Jesus is our Savior. And so the Spirit, okay, guides us to Christ, right? And then in Christ, he, Christ is the reservoir that connects us to the Father. So here it is, technically, to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. So very important. It, connecting with God relationally is where we start. Now listen, this idea of our Father, what does it mean? It, it's revealing to us the truest nature of God. God reveals Himself as Father. So that's intimacy. That's respect. Also, listen, notice it says our Father. We're not only children. When we go to God, even in our closet, we're mindful that we've got brothers and sisters that we need to be in relational harmony with. Our Father. So our Father establishes a relationship between believer and all other believers. That's huge. It shows us that, that God is our Father. He's a loving Father. And all of His love can be lavished on us through the Son and by the Spirit. And the word Father pinpoints God as our source of provision. And so, if you're a parent, how do you teach this to your child? Well, first, you introduce God as knowable and relatable. You, you help them understand how they establish a relationship with God. It's through Jesus Christ. So very important that we establish that so that our children are speaking to, not us. How many of you have been in a prayer meeting and it sounds like people are talking to each other, but they're not talking to God? Right? Our Father in heaven, look what it says next, hallowed be your name. So what, what, what's the second part? Once we acknowledge Him as Father, we come before Him as a child, right? We honor God's name. We start with worship. What does the word hallowed mean? It means we bless His name. We revere His name. We honor His name. Now, what kind of world do we live in? A world that dishonors His name. defames his name. And yet the scripture says it's in his name we find protection and power. Now Jesus knows that we need to remind ourselves of who God is and that his character is set apart from all others. So prayer is to be focused on him, not on us. There, where does our prayer start? Our prayers start with worship, with praise, with adoration. And how do we do that? We, we have to learn the character of God. So here's what we do. We, as parents, we teach our kids how to praise God and how to thank God for who he is. So we, look, we need a list. I'm going to suggest you get a list. All the names for God the Father. All the names for God the Son. And all the names for God the Holy Spirit. And teach those names to your children. Because once your children understand who God is and His names reveal His character, their automatic response is going to be pray. In fact, let's just think about it. This morning, 
I was focusing early this morning, real early this morning, on God as my healer. Anybody need some healing here? Well, he's already healed me of my greatest need. Right? Spiritual. My greatest healing is spiritual. So I can praise him because he's through the blood of Christ. Is ordained. But, but I began to praise him because he is my healer. Do you know if you're struggling with mental anxiety, if you're struggling with emotional turmoil this morning, do you know God is your healer? <laughs> When's the last time in your prayer closet you just focused on that attribute of who God is and, and learn from Scripture what does that mean and begin to just praise Him for who He is? No, here's how we do it. Help me, help me, help me. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give and Jesus says this is not the way prayer should be. It should start with you coming before God as your Father in the name of Jesus Christ. It should start with worship where we honor Him because we need to be reminded of this. By the way, when you read Scripture and you're studying Scripture, always ask this question. What's the God shot here? Is there, any ver is there anything in this verse that reveals to me who God is? Pull that out. It's a very important principle in your devotional life. But then thirdly, notice this. We have to pray God's agenda first. Look at the prayer. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. So we've come before Him as our Father because of Jesus Christ and what He's done. We've started with praising Him for who He is. We've given praise and adoration for Him. But now, guess, look at this is our first request. By the way, how long does it take you to get to request in your prayer time? Our first request has nothing to do with us. Our first request is to be centered on His priorities, not our personal needs. And so He's simply saying, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What are we doing? We're asking God to bring the rule and reign of his son here on earth like it is in heaven. Now, I know some of us, we're like, Lord, take me out of here. No, that's not the way we should pray. What God is doing is he's purging this earth from hell. He's taking sin and evil from this earth. Can I tell you, the earth belongs to the Lord. Satan doesn't have this place. God is going to bring His rule and reign here on earth. We're praying for the redemptive work of Christ to be complete. That's what we're asking God to do. I mean, one of my favorite prayers is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember that? He's in, the, he's in the garden and he's praying, Lord, if there be another way to save Ben and to save Jeff and to save Miss Linda and to save Larry and Carolyn. Lord, if there be another way to save Miss Summer or Aaron Victoria, if there's any way to save those people, please do it. But not my will, but what? Thy will be done. So what do we do to teach our children? Teach your children to avoid gimme, 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 gimme. You ever seen a child at Christmas? It could be the very worst thing we do for them. We give them, give them, and give them, and give them, and give them, and they begin to think that it's all about them. And then they begin to relate to God as a celestial Santa Claus. As if God is obsessed with giving them everything that they want. There's so much about some of the things that we do that really make it hard for our children to really develop a strong prayer life and have an accurate view of God. So, but, so instead of gimme, 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 let me, let me give you a couple of suggestions. Pray for a lost person by name. Pray for the advancement of the gospel in the darkest places of our world. Pray for the advancement of the church. Pray for the rule and reign of Christ. Let me tell you. just want to ask you a question. Are you personally involved right now in a movement, in a mission that's pushing back darkness in our world? Or are you just riding through on a carousel? If you are personally involved in a mission 
that's directly connected in pushing back lostness, lostness, reaching people, whether they're here or some other country. Let me tell you what you're going to do. Your first prayer request. If you've been on a mission trip, what's your first prayer request? If you've been in the inner city of Baltimore, many of you have. If you've ever been to different parts of the world, third world countries, listen, you're not asking God for the gimme, gimme, gimme. You're like, oh God, <laughs> push back darkness. We, we see evil like we've never, like there's bullet holes in the church in Baltimore. I mean, like, you know, there, it's, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. So we're to pray not for us to be delivered from earth, but for hell to be removed from the earth. That's what God's going to do. He's going to remove hell from this earth. He's going to purge it from all sin and all evil. And so here's how it starts. Our Father, we're connecting with a personable God. A God who wants a relationship with us. Hallowed His name. We start with Him. He's who we're talking to. We're not talking to other people. We're talking to Him. We praise Him for who He is. And then we begin to pray His agenda. And then we get to the part that we're so good at. We depend on God for everything. Look what it says next. Give us today our daily bread. You see, once we spend time with our attention solely focused on God, then we come to Him with our needs. With our needs. Now, what are we doing when we go to God with our needs? What are we doing? We're acknowledging that God is the source and provider of all of our needs. Does God want us to do that? Say yes. Yes. God wants us to look to Him as our provider. God wants us to look to Him as our protector and sustainer. You see, the, the three things that you and I most need in life, okay, God has provided through Jesus Christ forgiveness of sin. He's already done that. And so much spiritual provision. And so listen, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, Psalm 121, it's our memory verse. He says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? Where are you going for help? And the psalmist says, my help comes from where? From the Lord who made heaven and earth. So grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, you teach your children. God has everything we need. So let's express our total dependence upon him. So we're going to sing this song in a few minutes. But you teach your child, Lord, I need you at school tomorrow. I'm scared. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I, I need you. We're, we're teaching them that God is the source. Can I tell you? No matter how much money you have, you cannot provide everything that your child needs. And if you don't teach them to approach God as the source of their need, guess what? They're going to go to many other places. How, how do you teach a teenage girl? Where, where, where do you teach her to get her, her, her desire to be loved and belong and, and to be loved? How, where, where, how do you teach them? You get it from God. Not from boys. Outside of wedlock. You have a need to belong. You have a need to be loved. Well, guess what? I, we understand that. But God, you are loved. And, and you have a personal relationship with the Lord. And so listen, we teach our kids to approach God for all of their needs. And this includes forgiveness. Your kid's going to mess up. He's going to make a royal mess of his life. He's going to need forgiveness. And we teach them. How do we respond when we mess up as Christians? Do we get beat up by guilt? Do we, do, we, do we get beat up by shame? Do we let it defeat us? Do we let it define us? Or do we come to God who provides generously? And this includes forgiveness for Christians. We are the total mess ups. Right? I'm going to ask you, are you a mess up? More than once every day. Let's just be honest about where we are here. And then notice this next part. Get your heart right with God and people. Look at this next part. He says, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is an interesting verse. We promise God something. God, forgive us for sinning against you. 
Because we've already forgiven everybody at church who sinned against us. You're going to eat turkey at Thanksgiving. You say, God, forgive me for my sin as I forgive all the cousins who sinned against me. What are we doing? We're recognizing that sin is a problem in our life. We're understanding that prayer can be hindered when we refuse to confess our sin. Can I just ask you a question? When's the last time, be honest, let the Holy Spirit guide you. When's the last time you spent 30 minutes in cleansing and confession? Oh, I got it. You don't struggle with sin. I want to just go ahead and say it. I think we need daily time. I know we need weekly time. I mean, I mean, I think we need one day a week. Like, you need to put this in your calendar. You need to get along with God, and you need to say, Lord, would you, Holy Spirit, point out any attitude in me that's not in alignment with Christ? Holy Spirit, have I not done something that I should have done? Point it out so I can repent. Have I done something that's in violation and disobedience to your will? We, we, we've got to guard our hearts against sin. We've got to keep short accounts with God. I, I love Psalm 66, 18. I love this verse because it reminds us that we need to take sin seriously. It says, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have what? So have you ever been in a situation where you've been praying and praying and you just feel like there's a block, there's a barrier? Sin is a hindrance to answered prayer. Now listen, if you're a true believer, you've trusted Christ, sin doesn't cause you to lose your position, but it certainly hinders your relationship, right? If I'm disrespectful to Christy, if I sin against Christy, my wife, right? We're still married. But our, our relationship ain't going to be sweet. It's not going to be warm. All right? It's not going to be what God desires for it to be. And the same is with us. So we need to teach our kids to talk to God about their sin. One of my favorite, well, I shouldn't say it's my favorite times, but maybe it's an important time when your kids are young. How many of you had kids that fought each other? Just to preach your kids fight each other? Okay. Um, or they would just, oftentimes we'll say, tell your brother he's sorry. That's not the way it starts. You got to talk to God. We, we have a clear understanding, right? Hey, Daniel, that's my oldest son. Hey, Daniel. Hey, T.W. Hey, Hannah. Hey, look. You have a clear understanding of what, what you've done first is you sinned against God. So who do you need to talk to first, son? And you do this in a loving way. You're shepherding them from your heart. You're not beating them over the head. Hey, son, so, so who, who, who do you need to talk to first about this? Who do you think? God. Well, let's talk about God for a moment. First John 1 John 1.9 says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We can sing this song that we sang. Our sin is many or much. But his mercy is what? Oh, oh, okay. So now Daniel and T.W. and Hannah, or, or your child, now he's getting the right view of God, but he's messed up, and he knows he's messed up. But he doesn't run from God. He runs who? He runs to God because his mercies are what? His mercies is more. Even when you discipline your kids, you're presenting the right view of God. And you're helping them learn how to relate to God. And you know what? <laughs> All of us are going to have to deal with sin in our life. Andrew Mary says it like this. The greatest reproach to God is the sin of prayerlessness. Now when you think about the most immoral thing you've ever done in your life. Pretty wicked stuff in here, isn't it? And Murray says, that ain't nothing. 
the greatest offense to a God who created you and gives you breath in your lungs, who saved you through the blood of His own Son, is for us not to want to talk to Him and to neglect our relationship. Can I just say something else? Listen to me carefully. I'm going to come down because I want everybody to hear this. There are three things you cannot neglect. I mean, delegate, excuse me. How many of you like to delegate? <laughs> there are three things you can't. Your relationship with God is one of them. If you're going to have a healthy relationship with God, it won't be because your, da- it won't be because your daddy was a preacher. You cannot delegate your role as a spouse. And you cannot delegate your role as a parent. Everything else, you can give to somebody else. But not those three things. And yet oftentimes, we neglect our relationship with God. We, we, we go around as if we can just delegate it to someone else and it's just not going to happen. And then finally, in this prayer we close, we pray for leadership from God and deliverance from temptation and evil. Look at the last part. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Well, we know that God doesn't lead anyone into temptation. But we do know that God allows temptation to test us. And what Jesus is wanting everybody at Central to know this morning is that life in this broken world is a war. Have you ever heard of warfare prayer? Have you ever participated in it? Is the church even talking about warfare prayer? We're praying for God's deliverance from an enemy. You have three of them. Satan who wants to devour you. First Peter says that he's like a lion. Can I just tell you? Mom and dad, listen. Grandma and grandma. The enemy wants to devour your kids. He would actually like to devour you in front of your kids. We have the world. That's another enemy. This is a... A system that's opposed to God. It's a system that says everything that God says is right is wrong. How many of you recognize we live in that worldly system? That's an enemy. And then we have the flesh. And I want to just tell you, the devil doesn't have to do much to a lot of us because we lose the battle with our flesh. The Bible tells us that even though we get saved, this sinful nature... We still have to battle it every day. And there's a war inside between the flesh and the spirit. And it never goes away until we go to be with Jesus. Samuel Chadwick said it like this. The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies. Prayerless work. Like if you went to Sunday school this morning outside the power of prayer, you ain't scared the devil. Not one bit. He ain't worried about you. But call your class to pray all night on Friday or Saturday. Begin to pray before you meet and see see what happens. He says he laughs at our toil, he mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. How many of you recognize we need God's strength and wisdom to win the battle? And so let me close by just asking you this. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you about your relationship with God? Do you enjoy prayer? Do you love it? Is it a first priority in your life? Does your prayer plan match Jesus' pattern? On every seat in, in the house when you came in was this little card, my prayer strategy. I want you to take it out for just a second because this is the invitation. I want you to give serious consideration to this. And I want you to, you don't have to do it right now, but today, sometime, I want you to ask the Lord, well, what is the time of the day that would be best for you to spend time with Him 
And maybe there's more than one time. Maybe it's in the morning and then in the afternoon or night. I want you to ask the Lord, what, what's the right place or places? I want you to write this down. And, and then we've given you the pattern that Jesus gave us to follow. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I was looking at these this week and letting the Lord. And sometimes the Lord will point out one of these that like is kind of missing right now in my prayer life. And I'm like, Lord, I need to work on this. I, I need to get your agenda back at the front of my agenda in prayer. We've given you the pattern that Jesus gave us to follow. So that we don't create a pattern that's less powerful. Right? So I want you to bow your head for just a moment. And just give the Holy Spirit permission to speak into your life about your relationship with God. Maybe you're here today and you realize that you don't have a relationship with God. You've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. And, and you, you sense that the Holy Spirit is leading you that. Right now, you just need to ask Him to forgive you of your sin and place your faith in Him. But maybe you're already a Christian and you realize that you're, you've been neglecting this. And this is an area where you need to grow. I know for me, I've got a lot of growth points. Maybe you're like me, you just need to confess to him that you've been trying to do prayer your way. Fit it in when you can, say what you can, and you need a new template to follow.